Well, good morning and happy new year. Well, that was kind of weak, but I'll go with it. <laughs> happy, happy new year. <laughs> um, I get it. Everyone's exhausted. <clears throat> um, but uh, if you are a guest here, either online or uh, with us today, I welcome you to Southside Bible Church. We pray that you find that the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ is here and his word is preached. So um, if you would go ahead and pray with me as we open. Lord, that this is your body and this is your word. I pray that your spirit would come and uh, preach. Make Christ be glorified in it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. An Englishman would regularly have his time of scripture reading and prayer early in the morning. However, this was the time of day when his dog and enthusiastic terrier was most active. He found that his terrier would run about the room snuffling and barking. In order to keep the peace, the man would tie his dog to the bed for the duration of his scripture reading and prayer. After about an hour, he would untie the dog for the remainder of the day. Many years later, a man's son grew up and obtained a place of his own. And he also found time to devote himself in the morning to scripture reading and prayer. He made sure his time was an hour long, and he too would tie his dog to the bed, though he did not know why. Again, many years passed, and the son's daughter grew up and obtained a place of her own. She found that she was much too busy to devote herself to scripture reading and prayer. However, she did tie her dog to the bed every morning for an hour. <laughs> so why do we do what we do? It's so easy to get into a groove and just do what we do and not really think much about why we do what we do. And so this morning, I wanted us to reflect as it is, we've come to the end of a year, we are starting a new year, and so what, what would be a good thing to reflect on? So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. And as I stated to Robin uh, Conwell this morning, um, it feels like we're going to take 20 pounds of sugar and put it into a five-pound bag. So um, if it feels a little intense about pace and all of that, there's, there's a reason I apologize. But uh, this whole section is... is to be together. So I wanted to get the whole section together as we go through this and reflect on things here in Ephesians. Okay, so starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you've been called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So the first thing that, we, that you may notice, there are many biblical scholars in the uh, congregation, and we, we start with the word, therefore, right? And a good biblical scholar will ask, what is the therefore? Therefore, yeah, that's right. So uh, therefore, I was always, always pushing us back and saying there's a reason for this. And the reason is that we've hit a break point. There are six chapters in the book of Ephesians, and chapter four begins what are called imperatives, directives, commands, things that we should do. And uh, the first three chapters of Ephesians, chapters one through three, were indicatives. These are the whys. And so as we step into chapter four, the implication is that we've read chapters one through three and, and, and are saturated in the indicatives, the reasons why. And so instead of reading all the way through those chapters, I want us to just hit the highlights of some of the things in that first three chapters. So chapter one, verse three, in Christ, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Chapter one, verses four through six, 
God chose us and called us to himself before time even began. Chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, in Christ, and according to his wisdom and love, our sins have been forgiven. Chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, in Christ, we have an inheritance that includes the seal of the Holy Spirit now in all who believe in Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, though we did not deserve his mercy, let alone anything else, because we were children of wrath. In Christ, God showed his mercy to us, calling us to salvation and bringing us from death to life and seating us with himself in the heavenly places. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, in Christ, we have been brought near when we were outsiders, outcasts. He brought us about to a lasting peace that is based in himself. Chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, in Christ we've been granted access to God and can approach him as we go through various trials. Chapter 3, verses 14 to 19, in Christ we can know the love of God that is in himself and it's a vast, amazing, deep love that we'll spend our entire eternity Basking and knowing and growing in. Chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Because of Christ, what God can do in us, through us, what God has already done and what God has for us is beyond what we could ever think or grasp or know. So this is the depth of what we approach when, when we hit the therefore here. Before we start with the command, before we start with that imperative. These are all the truths, these beautiful, deep truths. And if you've ever been to a birthday party, and I'm assuming most everyone here has been, birthday party for a young child, if you've ever seen a little one um, uh, as they unwrap their gifts, they're excited. And the more gifts they unwrap, the more excited they get. And they're really, really thrilled. And when it comes to the end of the gifts, gratitude is not what I would describe. <laughs> it's, give me more. Where's more? Give it to me, right? That's, that's, that's how you describe a child. Now, I want you to, if you've ever been to a more mature birthday party, a person who uh, is uh, more grown up, as they receive each gift and as the gifts mount, their gratitude, their thankfulness, and their joy increases. When they come to the end of their gifts, they're just bursting with thankfulness. And, and that's how we should approach chapters one through three. We don't want to be the petulant little child that has received all these great gifts, looks at God and says, I deserve more. Give me more more. And yet, that's how some approach these things. Independence and sucking it in and what great gifts give me more. Instead of a person that has been so overwhelmed with what God has done that it begs the question, Lord, ask me whatever you want me to do. I will crawl down the barrel of a cannon. I will do this because of what you have done. And you see, this is the heart that Paul is expecting when we hit chapter 4, verse 1, with the therefore. A person, a believer, who has read these things and is saturated and says, I am so overwhelmingly grateful whatever you ask could never even begin to be too much it's just the start so i pray that's where our hearts are this morning with the therefore and here here he is paul says i the prisoner of the lord so he's he's a he's an old man in prison shivering in cold and he implores Parakaleo to come alongside, to plead, to beg, please, 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 will you hear me? Please, will you, will you give yourself to this? I implore you. 
So what is it that he's begging us, asking us, pleading for us to do? He says, please walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called. So let's break this down first. Walk. Um, walk is something that we do and we take one step at a time. That's what a walk is, right? If you're taking multiple rapid steps, that's a run. If you're taking two steps at a time, that's a jump. If you're taking long strides between steps, that's a skip. It's not the way we do life. We do life one step at a time. We walk. So whenever we have a reference to walking, it's a reference to the moment-by-moment walk. Moment-by-moment living of the Christian life. So we are to walk, and it says, in a manner worthy. So here's the thing. This isn't saying in a manner that pays for or in a manner that is um, equivalent to what we've been called to. Could, could you and I ever begin to scratch the surface of repaying God for what he has done for us in Christ Jesus? Can't even begin to scratch the surface of that. So it's not about repayment. What it's doing is it's picking up all of those amazing truths. Your sins have been forgiven. You're at, you've been given the righteousness of Christ. You, you're a child of God. You've been given an inheritance beyond your wildest dreams. You can't even begin to imagine. All of these things, should, our, our, our lives should reflect the value of that. Right? It should be fitting. It, it's not the 400-pound guy in spandex at the gym. That's, that's not fitting, right? It's fitting, but it's not fitting. <laughs> it's, it's, that, it's that pair of jeans or that dress that somebody says, that just, that fits you. It's perfect. And you, you see, as Christians, our lives should fit what we've been given. It should be fitting. And, and then it's, it's, we're going to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called. It implies something, that we were called to this, that God called you. He called you out of darkness into his light. He called you from far off and drew you near. He called you. You've been called, and you want to walk in that manner that's worthy, that's fitting in that same way, that, that fits. It's perfect. So if, if I've got chapters one through three in mind, then i I should understand better what it is to walk in a manner fitting. And, and Paul doesn't just leave us there and say, okay, I want you to walk in a manner worthy. Now let's get on to the next thing. He's, he's going to give us six implications or six things to think about with, with regard to what does it look like to walk in a manner worthy of the calling? What does that look like? And that's where we step into verse 2. It says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Here are the things that, that he calls us to, that, that it looks like. First thing on the list, not surprising, is we're to do this in humility. In humility. And humility is huge. It's something that we could probably spend an entire sermon series on. What is humility? I don't have that kind of time. You, your, your poor backsides don't have that kind of reach. So we're going to just try to compact this with a few thoughts. Um, Philippians 2, uh, verse 3, Colossians 3, 12, 1 Peter 3, 8, 1 Peter 5, 5, all mention humility, and they mention humility with gentleness, by the way. Um, they all mention humility. The reason why I'm going to bring that up is um, humility is talked about fluidly throughout the New Testament. So let me give you just some things to think about with regard to humility. C.S. Lewis made the statement, humility is not to think less of yourself, 
but to think of yourself less. Okay? So this, uh, his statement had to do with um, quantity more than quality, right? And usually when we think of humility, we just say, well, what I need to do is just understand that I'm a worm. <clears throat> and if your entire day is spent on the fact that you are a worm, you spent the entire day on yourself. That's not humility. So there's a quantitative aspect of it. So if I'm to think of myself less, then what would I be thinking on? I should be thinking on others. And Philippians 2, 3 through 4 would agree with that. We need to think of ourselves rightly. Um, Philippians 2, again, would state this. We need to think of ourselves rightly. Um, please... <laughs> Do think of yourself, particularly when it comes to bathing, deodorant, and brushing your teeth. I appreciate it. It's helpful. Um, so there is a quality of thinking of yourself, but again, with regard to others. And I need to think of myself rightly. I need to think of myself as a servant of Christ. Yes, you are a son or a daughter. Yes, you are a prince or a princess, but not of this land. Our kingdom is his kingdom, it's his kingdom, and his kingdom is not, not of this world. You and I are called to servanthood. Let us think of ourselves rightly. I think more people are offended by the fact that you don't know that I am a daughter of the king or a son of the king, but you're a servant of the king. And we're called to serve, and our Lord Jesus Christ was the greatest servant of all. Matter of fact, he said, you want to be greatest in the kingdom? Be the least. Think of myself less. Therefore, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling means that we must be humble. Second, he mentions with all humility and gentleness. So in gentleness, we've got Colossians 3.12, puts gentleness and humility together. Um, gentleness is the fruit of the Spirit. 2 Timothy 2.25, Titus 3.2, 1 Peter 3.15, we're instructed to be gentle when dealing with those who are in opposition to us. We must be gracious even when disagreeing with others. We're to be gentle. Gentle men, gentle women. Not harsh. Not unkind. Gentle, even when people disagree. Therefore, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling means that we must deal with others gently and meekly, no matter how they are to me. And he says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience. So this implies something, okay? First of all, uh, patience, uh, makra, thumeo, makra, not macro. Macro would be big. Makra is long, makra thumeo, to uh, long in passion, okay, long passioned. It's uh, how we get our thought towards uh, patience. And patience, uh, it too, is a fruit of the Spirit. It's an attribute of love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. So here's what it implies, though, patience. What it implies is that people are not easy to get along with because not everyone is like me. Right? Not everyone does things in the same way, at the same speed, in this, at the same time. Patience is called for. Right? So patience wouldn't be required if no one else was in the picture. But patience is required because other people are in the picture. So this tells us that patience is a is a part of, of being in the body of Christ. You have to be patient. I have to be humble. I have to be gentle. I have to be patient. And therefore, to walk in a manner worthy of calling means that we must deal with others patiently. And then it says, again, showing tolerance for one another in love. This again, just it's, it's not even implied. It's just downright stated that you're dealing with other people and those other people are difficult sometimes. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. Sometimes it's just the way that they are. 
And this isn't tolerance in the respect that we think of in today's society. Tolerance in today's society is um, accept me for the way that I am no matter what. So accept my sin is usually the implication. That's not what's being communicated here. Because we're, we're to show tolerance and it's to be wrapped in love. We'll get to that here in a second. The, the thought here in the Greek is, is to bear up or bear with one another. That means um, that any amount of pressure that can be brought upon us, it's, it's sustainable. It can be sustained. It's never too much. It's never, you're too much for me, I'm done with you. Just never write anybody off. There should be a tolerance. Colossians 3.13 uh, speaks of this. So therefore, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling means that we must be able to bear with one another. And then it says, in love. Um, so again, we could spend an entire sermon series talking about the love of God. And the word for love, there are four Greek words for love. This one is uh, agape, agapao the one that's commonly chosen to reflect the love of God. Um, it, too, is a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. It's something that only God produces and gives, 1 John 4, 7, and 8. So, f- for now, we mentioned only in passing um, that, that we know that it is true of the walking in a manner worthy, therefore, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling means that we must love one another. And imagine that. It's almost like there's verses in the Bible that preach that. Okay, And, and it's important that this love aspect is in there lest we think tolerance and patience is us holding our nose and, and gritting our teeth, enduring other people who are not like me. I'm just going to put up with you. And that's not what love is. Love isn't putting up with you. Love is loving you. And that's why I'm patient and gentle and kind through these things. And then the last thing that he mentions is verse 3, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Massive implications of this verse. If you're preserving something, and and the word is actually to guard or garrison or protect, to fight for, that means you already have it. It means it's already there. The world is trying to unify. The world is pursuing unity. They're trying to make unity. This says we already have unity. We have unity and it's in the Spirit of God. And we're to fight for it. That also implies that there's going to be things that come against us that try and rip it apart. And we need to be protective of it. We need to be protective of it. We should view ourselves as the body of Christ inside of a fort shooting outside the fort to protect that unity. What do you commonly see? You see soldiers inside the fort shooting at one another. That's not unity. It's not unity. Now, I know this begs the question, what's unity? And, and aren't, aren't we just going to base this in some willy-nilly, fluffy, just feeling of we just need to be unified and that's what we need to fight for. We just need to be unified on just to be unified. And you know that's not correct. And it's as if Paul even predicts that because the next three verses deal with what we're unified around. So we don't even have to sit here and debate what it is that we need to be unified around. We get it here in black and white. This is what we need to unify over. Um, In uh, verse 4, it says, there is. Here, I want you to stop for a second. I want you to look at your Bibles. And I want you to look at those two words, there is. And I want you to note 
that in most of your Bibles, it should be italicized. And the implication of that is it's not there in the Greek. That doesn't exist. That there is, is not there. Okay, meaning uh, to make this work in English, we need a subject and we need a verb. And so we put a subject and a verb in there. There is, okay? But that's not there. So why is this there? So essentially what happens in the Greek is it says, in the bond of peace, one body, one spirit. That's how it goes. So what I would want you to almost do is change that there is to a colon. Right? And what does a colon do in the English language? Punctuation doesn't exist in Greek. Um, That's why it's not there. So what does that do in English? Whenever we do a colon, we're expounding upon something that we just said, right? We're going into a list of something. And so what, I'm, what I want you to see is he's talking about unity. He's not leaving us flat on unity. So what do we unify around? One body. One body. He reminds us that it, there is one body. There is no differentiation made by race, ethnicity, color, pigmentation of skin, sex, male or female. None of that's there. There's, that's not our differentiating factor. We are one body. One body. It means that's a living organism. It doesn't say that we're one club, right? A club is that we're unified together on a common likeness. Instead, we're one body. We're one living organism. And we are thus because God has made us thus. He has given us five fingers for the most part. Five toes, for the most part. Two legs, two arms, a head, all representative of what a body is. And this is the body of Christ. Um, This is put on display in in Romans 10, verses 11 to 13. So independent American mindset um, tells us that I I do what I want to do. I need no one. And that independent mindset that's a part of our American heritage is very damaging. We're not independent of one another. First of all, we're all dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there should be a thought towards a dependence upon you, the body, as well, that we are all a part of. It's, it's not that church leadership even is independent of the body. Church leadership needs the body. Just like the body needs the leadership, we need one another, and everyone has been called to it. You have been gifted in it, and you are a part of it. There's one body. One body. And that, that's why uh, Southside Bible Church encourages you to be a part of one body to dedicate yourself to one local assembly, wholly and solely to one. Dedicate yourself to the bride. One body. So it's not just about the one body, though. One spirit. What spirit are we talking about? We're not talking about um, spirit weak, where we're all rah, rah, hoorah. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. It should be capitalized in your... Bibles, because of what it implies. This is the Spirit of God. And here's something that is very true of every single believer. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Whether you feel like it or not, whether you sense His presence or not, He is there He has come to reside in your life, never to depart. He is a seal that God has placed on you that says He guarantees to come for you, His child. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are a believer in Christ if you have the Holy Spirit. We believe in this one Spirit. We're unified around the one body, We're unified around this one spirit. 
He goes further. Just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. There's one hope. And guess what? That hope is not 2021, by the way. And, and I know it feels like it after the way 2020 went. But your hope isn't 2021. Your hope shouldn't be in the government or the governmental leaders. Your hope shouldn't be your next vacation. Your hope shouldn't be your children. Your hope shouldn't be your family. Your hope should be one hope. And that one hope is Christ. And to be with him and to glorify him for all eternity. That's your one hope. And for a true believer, for a person who trust, has trusted Christ, that should be your everything. That should be your one hope. And no matter what happens in 2021, no matter what happened in 2020, that hope should never go away. That should be your one hope. And every believer should be unified around that one hope hope. We should be unified in encouraging one another to that one hope. Get your eyes off of this and that and back onto him. One hope. One hope. Unless we forget it, one Lord. Kurios. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 3. I'm going to turn there. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 3. says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit of God, says, Jesus is accursed. And no one who says, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So here's the thing. We are unified around one Lord. That one Lord, He is Jesus Christ. He is Lord, which means He is Master, which implies we are servants. We bow our knee to Him. Every true believer should be saying yea and amen to Jesus Christ as Lord. We are unified around the fact that Jesus is Lord. Is this sounding wishy-washy to you? It shouldn't, because it's not. It's very succinct, and it's what we're founded upon. Jesus is Lord, and we acknowledge him as Lord. One faith. One faith. So what is the one faith? Romans um, 10, 8 through 10. Romans 10, 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, there it is again, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the implication is that his death was sufficient. It was the atonement for sin. That God raised him from the dead, and that means that God said, satisfied and Jesus was raised from the dead, satisfied, penalty paid. You will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. One faith. There are not multiple faiths. There are not multiple ways to God. There is but one. It is by faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work alone and that is it. It is not of yourself. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. Every believer should say, I have nothing to boast. I believe only Jesus Christ and him crucified and him raised. Thanks be to God. That is the one faith that we are unified around. We are unified around this faith. What else? One baptism. Oh boy, there we go. <clears throat> now we got our Baptists and our Presbyterians shooting it across the aisles, and what do we do with that? 
It says there's one baptism. This isn't a debate about uh, submersion versus sprinkling, infant versus adult. What this is a debate on, first and foremost, is have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? Okay, Meaning, have you professed and come to know Jesus Christ? But that is not all this means. Otherwise, uh, just one spirit would have sufficed for that. This is talking about baptism. And baptism was huge in the early church because it was an outward expression of an inward reality. It was a public display that a believer put on to say, I am Christ, Jesus is my Lord, I will serve him, and I want to make a public acknowledgement of that. That's what baptism is. So um, we believe in a believer's baptism. And that baptism is in Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not in an individual. 1 Corinthians 1, 13-17, Paul said, baptism isn't about who I baptized. It's not, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. No. It's I am Christ's. He owns me. One baptism. And before we wrap it up, one God. One God. We are unified around one God. Quite simply, there is one who created all things. There's only one who is powerful, all powerful, all knowing, all wise, all good, all righteous, all just. There is only one, and there is only one God. He is that God as he has revealed himself in his one word. There are no other gods. There is no other way. There is no other creator. There is no other master. He is the one. One God. He is, as he has revealed himself to be through his word. This is the one God that we are unified around. We are unified in this one God. One Father. One Father, one God and Father. As believers, we serve a God that, it, that we identify as our Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is the way Christ taught us to pray Matthew 6, 9, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It is how Paul refers to God in the opening of many of his letters, Romans 1, 7, 1 Corinthians 1, 3. 2 Corinthians 1 2, Ephesians 1 2, Philippians 1 2, Colossians 1 2, 2 Thessalonians 1 2, Philemon 1 3. Always referring to, in all of those passages, to God our Father. You might not have known your Father here on earth, you might not have known a good Father. But as a believer, you and I have the best Father, our Heavenly Father, whom because of the blood of Christ we can approach. We can know this good Father. And we get to know this good Father for all eternity. So it doesn't matter what your life has been like here. If you have trusted Christ, I know what your life will be like and who your father is and how he will be for all eternity. He is a good father. We are unified around this one father. And then the last statements are, he's the one God and father of all, of all believers, who is over all, he is over all things, and in all. So there's even Trinitarian aspects to this, for it is God the Father who is over all, as is Christ. Through all, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, in all the Holy Spirit resides in each of us. We are unified in this Trinitarian God as he has acknowledged and represented himself. So when we fight for the unity of the Spirit, 
in the bond of peace, we do so based upon these truths. We unify around these truths. We're not unified in some arbitrary thing. And we're not unified in an arbitrary statement of we're unified in truth because then that just allows me to set something out there and inject into it whatever I want. And, and that might be your interpretation of the book of Revelation. It might be your interpretation of a certain psalm or a proverb. And, and you see how dicey this can get. And now we've, we've got hundreds of different denominations differentiating on hundreds of different things. Some of them are, are just downright silly. Uh, some of them are based in these truths. And so we're not left with wondering what we unify around. So I don't want you to walk away thinking fuzzy. It's here in black and white. Pick it up, read it for yourself. We are unified around who God is. We are unified in his spirit. We are unified in his body. We are unified in what this faith is. Don't shoot across the aisles at each other because you disagree about what a government does or doesn't do. Or you disagree about whether or not you should have a certain right or not. Those aren't the things that we are to, to part over. We're to be unified in these truths. Now, I'm not saying don't debate. By all means, debate. Here's the thing. Do so with humility, gentleness, patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Don't suddenly throw all of that out as you seek to sharpen iron with others. We, we could get vast different interpretations on certain passages in Scripture. And we should seek to get the right interpretation. So don't get me wrong. I'm not calling for fuzziness here. But you, we shouldn't do so at gunpoint to one another. What has God called us to? To walk in a manner worthy of his calling. Walk in the manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called. How can we best reflect Christ? How can we best reflect what he has done for us? What an amazing, amazing gift we've been given. So in light of 2020, which is a very uh, difficult year for many of us, and in light of 2021 starting, here's what I want us to start with. And I'd like you to do this sometime uh, today or, or this week. I want you to get alone with the Lord. And I want you to ask him, have I walked in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have called me? Have I done this? And if you find yourself deeply convicted, know that there's a good father on the other end of that conversation that I can repent to. And I can receive abundant grace and forgiveness. And then I want you to pray and ask, Lord, in 2021, may I walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which I've been called. May I honor you. In every word, in every deed, in every thought, God, may I walk in a manner worthy of the calling. It's, it's there in Scripture. It's in, it, extremely convicting, yes. And what makes it so weighty is everything that He has done for us and continues to do and will do. It's amazingly weighty because of the overwhelming value of everything in which he has given to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So may we walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called. 
a professional violinist was given a, giving a concert. When he finished, the crowd jumped up from their seats and gave him a standing ovation. He had delivered a magnificent performance. The young violinist, with tears coming down his cheeks, walked off the stage dejected. The stagehand saw him and said, why are you so sad? Those people are going crazy out there and you're crying, I don't understand. Do you see the one man in the center down there? He is still sitting. The stagehand said, yes, so, so what? There are 2,000 other people who are standing. This is true, but you don't understand. The man down there in the middle is my father. He also is my violin teacher. If he does not stand, it does not matter what 2,000 other people do. If God does not applaud when he sees what, how we live our lives, it doesn't matter what everybody else does. May we walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Will you pray with me? God Most High, you are worthy of all of our praise. You are worthy of our lives. And you are worthy to be put on display in our lives. May our lives reflect what you have done in Jesus Christ. May we know the breadth of the height, the length, the depth of the love that you have. And may that be reflected and radiated out to a world that desperately needs you. May we be found worthy in the way that we deal with one another. May we be found worthy in the way that we deal with the world. Lord, may it be a worthy sacrifice to you for all that you have done, for we could never repay everything that you have done for us. So may our lives just reflect the thank you for what you have done. And it's in Jesus' name, precious, that we pray these things. Amen.